10. Amen. Well, um, my aim this morning um, is to first give a, a brief recap on what we've covered the last, uh, basically last month. So if this is your first time, which I don't think it is so much for anyone in here, but if it is, this will be good. You'll be able to catch up if you've missed. And if you've been here each week, which a lot of you have, and thank you, by the way, because it is a blessing to do this, then this will just be a good reminder. And then the majority of our time we're going to spend in a portion that Pastor Scott covered last week, but um, wasn't there for a very long time. So we're going to spend a lot— basically the whole time there. So we're not making any new progress in Joel, but we're going to make progress in our heart by getting it into us and understanding it better, Lord willing, and being impacted by what the Holy Spirit has to, has to say. So in Joel, um, if you've been with us from the beginning, you know that uh, Joel is prophesying to the southern kingdom, to Judah, and he, his the beginning, the first half of the whole book is basically about God coming against his own people. And we've talked about how it almost sounds wrong. Like, why would God ever oppose his people? But that's exactly what he does. He judges his own people. Now, we would call that today discipline, which he still does for us. He disciplines us. In this time, it was severe. It was a severe hand of discipline. And it wasn't that his people did one thing you know, they messed up, and, and so now here comes the hand. This was ongoing and growing and growing their idolatry and getting distant from the Lord and living for themselves. God loved them too much to let them go, and he loves us too much to let us go in those seasons of, of um, rebellion. So in chapter 1, we learned about the locust plague. And, you know, some will say that that was a, a true, a, a literal plague of locusts. I think it was. That came to the land and probably for years or at least a very long time, it devastated them. It ate up all their food. So it it took away their ability just to have personal enjoyment. It even says that in chapter 1 verse 12 that all their um, gladness dried up. That's so sad. It took away their ability to offer grain offerings and drink offerings in the house of the Lord. Any kind of entertainment like drinking, pleasure, all that's gone because of their sin. And then in, in that same place about the locust uh, plague, God calls them to repent and offers them mercy. And then in chapter 2, we saw where Joel talks about the day of the Lord. Not the day of the Lord that we know of, most familiar with the end, the final day of the Lord. Joel in that place was really speaking about a time much sooner to them. And a lot of people believe that it was probably speaking about the Babylonians coming in, which would happen basically 200 years after this. And you read chapter 2 and you see all the military language and a very clear picture of judgment now now no longer being the locust, but being an actual physical army, even more severe. It's a sad thing. And then Joel gives us once again— uh, well, really, God gives us an invitation to repent, the people of Judah to repent. And he gives a picture of what repentance is in verses um, 12 to 13 in chapter 2. He shows that real repentance is wholehearted, that it's mournful over sin, and that it's internal, not just external. It's not just, oh, okay, outwardly, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. It's internal. And in that same chapter, he gives us a picture of what, um, how repentance always has fruit that accompanies it. Fruit like fasting, prayer, seriousness, uh, warning others, other brothers and sisters, coming together. And then last week, Pastor Scott shared um, right around verse 18 through the end of the chapter where it talks about how God had pity on them, that they did repent. And he shared how he believes that that especially refers to when about 60 years after this was written, when the king of Assyria came, which you can read about in 2 Kings 19. And you remember he talked about the story, how he came and this wicked king who had already destroyed the northern kingdom, was coming for Judah, and 
Those people, praise God, had repented. They had a godly king, Hezekiah, who prayed and sought the Lord. And in the night, God sent an angel who struck down 185,000 uh, Assyrian soldiers. And that army was way bigger than what Judah could ever handle, could ever face. And God did exactly what he said. For example, in verse 20, I'll remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land. And he talks about the stench that would go up. And that's exactly what happened. All those men that died, the stench from their bodies, they were driven out. God is faithful to his word. He's always faithful to his word. That's basically what we've talked about so far. That, that has been Joel so far. So I'm sorry if that was a, like a speed rush through Joel. I just want to have as much time as possible for where we are today because I truly believe that it's something that the Lord desires for us to, to hear. And that would be verse 28. This whole time, <clears throat> Joel has been uh, talking to the people there uh, of Judah and then in verse 28, out of nowhere, it would seem, Joel skips centuries of time. He's no longer talking about any time coming up soon. He probably doesn't know the exact timing, but it's centuries later when he speaks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then in that, same very, that very same breath, as he's writing about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, takes a deep breath in. Now the next verse is even further than that. And it's the end of the end of the end, the final day of the Lord. So let's read it real quick. Verse 28. You almost get whiplash when you read it because he's been talking about something much sooner and now it's way further out. And it shall come to pass afterward, and this is chapter 2, verse 28, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, and your m young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Now verse 30, he goes even further into time, and this is the final day of the Lord. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, be, uh, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And what a beautiful promise. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Now here's the thing. This whole time, Joel has been talking to the people of Judah, not to you and I. Now we can gather lessons from it and we gather principles from it that absolutely apply to our lives. We don't ever want to say that the Old Testament isn't for us. I have heard people say that, that they only preach from the New Testament because the New Testament is our testament. And that's so silly because why would God, why would God include the Old Testament as part of his holy word? From the Old Testament, we're warned. We learn things. We observe from the, the bad example, the good example of other men and women of Israel. We see God's, uh, the, the weaving of Jesus throughout the pages of every single book and prophet all the way up till the New Testament that we, you know, are in. So you never discount the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is not written to Zach. That's why we don't take things like Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper, and, you know, that verse. It has total application to us, but not in the sense that God wrote that verse for your life and my life in particular. It was for a specific people at a specific time. And with Judah, or I'm sorry, with Joel, you know, for example, I'm just going to pick a random verse. Uh, I'll just say chapter 1, verse, I don't know, verse 4. When Joel said, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten, what the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten, what the hopping locust left, and the destroying locust has eaten. That has application in my life that I can gather from, from that. <clears throat> I, can, I can recognize, wow, look what sin does. It brings about discipline. In this case, it was locust. But that's not, that verse is not about my life. I don't have locust in my life. But when you come to verse 28 of chapter 2, 
it has complete application to you and I. All of a sudden, it's about you. It's not about Judah. That's amazing. Everything Joel has talked about has been Judah. Verse 28 is not about Judah. I mean, he wants them to know this is coming. There's a day coming, but that's not going to be for you guys. You're already going to be gone. You're going to be with the Lord. This is for Jason and Nikel and Shannon and Sierra and Mama Green and the Tabernacle of Tampa Bay and the other churches and other believers in a future day. Peter and, and James and John and Paul and others, when I will pour out my spirit. And that's why it's too significant for us to not spend a little bit of time thinking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The fact that God's Spirit dwells inside of us, empowers us, changes us. This whole book, I know it doesn't always seem like it, but this, really, this book has been a book of hope. There's been a lot of judgment. There's been a lot of warnings, a lot of just sadness uh, seeing how the people of God, their hearts have been toward God, distant from God. But it has been a book of hope in things like what the locusts have eaten, I'm going dis- to restore. The years that the locust has eaten, or in other words, what your sin has damaged and taken away, I'm going to restore. That's hope. Or uh, my people will never again be put to shame, those who take refuge in me. That's hope. The, when chapter 2, they talked about the mercy of God, that he's long-suffering, that he will grant mercy to those who truly repent. That's hope. But this verse about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit before the great and final day of the Lord, that is such amazing hope that we would not be left to, to go through life alone. We would not be left to, to try and strive and do and, and hopefully we'll do well. We have the Holy Spirit poured out upon us. Now, keep a finger in Joel 2, but if you would just turn, can anybody guess where we're going to turn? Another chapter 2, anybody know? Acts 2! So turn over to Acts 2. I know this is super familiar to, you know, probably all of us, but as you're turning, um, you know that Jesus when we get to Acts 2, Jesus had already told his disciples uh, to wait. He told them specifically, Luke 24, he said, uh, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. I'm sending you the promise. What promise? Where was that promised? Joel 2. That's where it was promised. Also Ezekiel, I think, 36, other uh, passages as well. But especially Joel 2. I will pour out my spirit. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men dream dreams, blah, 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 blah. That was the promise. And then also Jesus talked about it a lot too. When he was with the disciples for three years, he continually told them, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He's going to teach you. He's going to bring things to your remembrance. He's going to comfort you in my absence, my physical absence. And then even in, if you just look at Acts 1, verse 8, even here, Jesus, these are his last words before he ascended to the Father. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus was crucified at Passover and now it's been 50 days and now it's Pentecost where they celebrate and remember when God gave the law and all that that means. And there's 120 believers that have taken Jesus up on his word. They truly believe that what he said is true. I mean, look, he rose from the dead. That was amazing. We can trust him. And they're locked up in a room, and they're praying, and they're seeking God, and they're just waiting. They don't even know what it's going to really look like. And I'm sure that many of them who, are, who, who know the, the Jewish scriptures are thinking about Joel too. They're thinking about, yeah, I remember when Joel talked about you know, God spoke through him about this, how this day was going to come. Like, what is that going to be like? I mean, we're praying. I'm not really seeing it happen yet. I mean, it's exciting. I feel joy welling up in my heart, but what's it going to look like when the Holy Spirit of God is poured out upon us? And then the day comes, Acts 2, and when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's amazing. A lot of the Jews who were in town from all over the world for Pentecost, they heard a noise. I don't know if they heard them, because it wasn't a real wind. It was the sound of a wind, maybe like a hurricane force wind. <laughs> maybe they heard the sound. I don't know, because it says that it was in that room, so maybe the wind sound was only in the room. But they heard something, the Jews that were in town. Probably they heard the people, there was 120 of them, speaking in these other tongues, these other languages, declaring the wonders of God. And they gather, and then more gather, and more gather, and more gather. You know, when one crowd gathers, it just keeps uh, getting bigger. And they're very bewildered. How are these people knowing our language? I mean, that, aren't these guys from like the local area? How do they know my language? I'm from way over here. And Peter stands up, and he preaches a message to them, an amazing it's his first message ever, his first sermon. And it's an amazing and effective sermon. And in his message, he specifically quotes Joel, but he adds something to what Joel says. So look at verse 16 of chapter 2 of Acts. Peter says, This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now look at Joel again real quick. Let's find the, the missing link. Verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I shall pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see vision. So it looks like Peter kind of reversed that. He put the young men first, the old men next. No big deal. Uh, verse 29, even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. End. That's it. But Peter doesn't end there. He says, in those days, uh, again, verse 18, even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I'll pour out my spirit. Not end, comma, and they shall prophesy. That doesn't even seem like a big deal, but it's a huge deal. Peter just added to the word of God. What is he, who does he think he is? No, what it is is Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's quoting from Joel, but God, the Holy Spirit, is doing something inside of him and inside the, the men and women right there in the room, and he is revealing something. He, God is revealing that now that the Holy Spirit has been poured out, the fulfillment of what Joel talked about, now— all of God's people are prophets, not some like Joel, Isaiah, Micah. Everyone is a prophet. Uh, what's a prophet? Just someone who speaks for God. Someone who speaks on behalf of God with the authority of God. Now all believers who have the Holy Spirit living inside of them are prophets. And the, the example is happening right there in front of them because all the men and women, the 120 of them, are doing just that. They are speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance, and they are literally declaring the wonders of God. They're just praising God. They're probably preaching the gospel. They're just blessing God in other languages, but they're prophesying. Prophecy is not just like foretelling, like Joel foretold the day of the Lord, the Babylonians possibly, the, the locust invasion, the things like that. That is prophecy, but the prophecy that we know and what God has given to us is speaking truth. Speaking truth that is anointed by the Holy Spirit that is truly from the heart and the mind of God. And it's amazing to think that you and I, we're prophets. We are prophets. We speak for God in a humble way. Now, we don't make up stuff. We don't say, I've got a word from the Lord for you unless the Lord has so clearly given you something. That's not the kind of prophet that we are. We speak these words here, but with the power of the Holy Spirit that people in the Old Testament did not have. Prophets did. They had, you know, drips, like the Holy Spirit would drip down, but he has now been poured out into us. And so, 
because of how significant that is, I just want to share a few things about now that God's Spirit is in us, how that changes us, how that affects our lives. And number one, which, I mean, it's just so obvious throughout the book of Acts, is that God's Spirit in us makes us bold and effective witnesses who testify of the Savior and warn of judgment. We read Acts 1-8 when Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, then you will be my witnesses. Oh, you can be my witness now, but you're not going to have any power. But when the Holy Spirit comes on you, then you will be my witnesses. Apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be an effective, bold witness. And a perfect example is Peter. He had an open door given to him on a golden platter. He had an amazing open door to be a witness for Christ to that young little girl who questioned him, don't you, aren't you with Jesus? Aren't you with one of the disciples? And he completely blew it. Coward. Uh, No, no, I I don't even—he lied. He lied. He even cursed. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we will always shy away from opportunities. We will always uh, be uncomfortable and I I don't not have the heart or the vision to be a witness. But with the Holy Spirit, we're given power. Peter's first sermon was amazing. He never preached a sermon in his life. He always put his foot in his mouth when he was speaking to Jesus and the disciples. He said the dumbest things like we say sometimes. But here he is giving this most amazing sermon. It's nothing spectacular. It's not smart. It's not like some, you know, like he's a a, a Ravi Zacharias who has, you know, I love Ravi Zacharias, but it's not like he's using really smart lingo. He's just with his own words, but inspired by the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel with the power of, of God. Even in Acts um, 17, Paul is another example when he was speaking to the, the people at Mars Hill and declaring to them this unknown God. He specifically says to them, because again, the power of God is upon him. He says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Can you imagine Paul saying that to somebody? And, you know, like being able to say that, but he did because the power of God was upon him. He had boldness. He told the, the Thessalonians that, hey, look, guys, when we came to you, you remember, uh, we had just come from Philippi and like Macedonia where we received so much trouble and shame, but we dared to speak, to declare the gospel to you because we had boldness in our God. And we declared to speak to you out of much conflict. The power of God, the Holy Spirit. Stephen, to the religious leaders, remember the things he told them? He went through this whole thing through the Old Testament and then he turned it on them and said, you are guilty. And they stoned him to death. Um, John the Baptist, he was filled with the Holy Spirit in a sense as he spoke. Now it's a bit different than what we know because we live after Jesus died and rose from the dead. But John the Baptist spoke the words of God and he called out the religious leaders. He called out Herod, remember, who was living an immoral life. It ended up costing his life. Amazing things happen when God's Spirit is in us. Number two, God's Spirit in us makes us people of prayer. Before the Holy Spirit was even poured out, prayer preceded that outpouring. Before the Holy Spirit came down, they already were gathered together praying. How much more important is prayer than once the Holy Spirit came? It made them, it it like rocketed, skyrocketed their prayer lives to the point where we're told throughout the book of Acts that they devoted themselves to prayer. Man, it seems like they were already devoted to prayer. Oh, way more so now. And by the way, the only person they ever knew, the only person that Peter, James, John, you know, the other disciples, the 120, uh, but especially the disciples, the only person they ever knew who was filled with the Holy Spirit was Jesus. We, We know from Acts 10, Jesus was filled, anointed with the Holy Spirit. 
He was the only one they knew in those three years of ministry. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit, not until this day, but Jesus was. And what do they know about Jesus? He had such a prayer life. And it so impacted them that they said, Lord, no, don't teach us how to preach. Don't teach us how to do this or that. Teach us how to pray like you do. They were moved by Jesus' prayer life. They saw him often withdraw, withdrew, withdraw to lonely places, desolate places to pray. They saw him spend all nights in prayer many times. They saw him, this man of prayer. And so after receiving the Spirit, they themselves become people of prayer. And not just uh, private, but corporate prayer. Even in Acts, uh, what is it, the next thing, Acts 3? Yeah, the Acts 3. Remember Peter and John, they went into the temple at the hour of prayer. That's corporate prayer. They didn't forsake that either. They continued in prayer. And even after getting persecuted in Acts 4, we're not going to read it, but um, they were released from jail. They got, you know, threatened big time. And what was their response? To have a prayer meeting. They came back and they held a prayer meeting. And in that prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit filled them all over again. They were already filled two chapters ago, and now they're getting filled again. And that's going to be a very important point at the end of this morning. People of prayer. That's what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And number three, God's Spirit in us, it brings about true unity and love for the family of, of God, for the body of Christ. Do you know any group of people more united than the early church? I don't know any group of people more united. Do you also, do you know any group of people more diverse from each other than that group? There was fishermen. There were former tax collectors. So there's the poor. There's the wealthy. There were wives, you know, women in the, that group. There were former religious people like Paul, who eventually became um, got saved. He, he was obviously, we know, a, a Pharisee at one point. He was deeply religious. There were other few people that we don't know about their careers or their lifestyle. Very different people. You know, another thing, we talked on Wednesday about Levi, Matthew, when Jesus first called him to follow him, and he was a tax collector. You know that the tax collector, uh, historians say that the tax collectors in that day, they would even tax the fish of the sea. So that, that means that when Peter and John are out fishing and bringing in their fish before they met Jesus, and they're cleaning off their fish and bringing them home for their family and going to sell them and make an income, that they're going to be taxed by people like Levi for that fish. But yet now they're together. The very man that taxed them, that put an unnecessary burden upon them, they're now family with. They were so united, even with all their differences and all their different backgrounds. And look at Acts 4, just this quick little verse here in 32, chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. That is so different than what we know today. And look, the truth is, without the Holy Spirit, our unity is if it's without the Holy Spirit, our unity is totally superficial. And the best example that the Lord gave me was, as I thought about it, is work. Like, I'll just give you an example about where I work. I work at a consulting firm. I'm not a consultant, but I'm an assistant. So I book all their calls, schedule all their meetings, all their travel, all their expenses, all that kind of stuff. And I work with other people. Now, I go to work every day. I've been there for two years. I go every day. Uh, nine to five, sometimes a little bit longer. So I know my coworkers. I know the six people that I'm an assistant for. I know them. I know what their preferences are. I know what they expect of me, what I expect of them, etc. I'm united with them. I really am. I mean, I have to be. You have to be with your coworkers. But if it wasn't for me working there, I wouldn't have anything to do with any of them. I wouldn't hang out with them. I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't even know them. I, I wouldn't, we don't, we're not like each other. We've got totally different ideas and belief systems and feelings about things. The only thing that unites us is that we work together. And so then there's a bond. And I do love them. And I do care for them. I'm not trying to say I, I hate my coworkers. I'm just saying the bond that we have, it's, super, it's superficial. It's just work. That's the bond that we have. Now, there are some that I've been ministering to and I've been praying for God. To, and in fact, one that is just, 
amazing the things that God has opened the door for me to be able to share with a, a lesbian. And I, it's been such a blessing. So I, there is a special bond beyond the superficial work bond. But if it wasn't for work, a lot of these relationships, yours too, in your work setting, just wouldn't exist. But in the church, in the family of God, totally different. We are very different from each other, like at work. Different interests, totally different backgrounds, different parenting styles, different ideas of what's fun, different whatever. But in the church, in the family of God, it's very different because we are united. The bond of the Holy Spirit, the bond of peace, the love poured out. We are, we're blood-bought. We, we're washed with the same blood, cleansed. We're indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. There is unity here, even though we're not a perfect church, there's unity here that you will never, ever get at work or at any other setting where people are linked together. Now, our unity can always grow, but with the Holy Spirit, with God's Spirit in us, there is true unity, true love. Number four, God's Spirit in us empowers us to live holy lives. What, what is the name of the Spirit of God who lives in us? Anybody? What? Oh, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit living in us makes us holy. He empowers us to live holy lives. We don't just uh, have a hit list on sins that we're trying to get rid of, and we need to grow in our knowledge of God's Word, and we'll be able to be better equipped to fight those. No! We fight sin by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. That's why Paul can say, put to death what's sinful in you. Not because of your knowledge of the Word. That's very important. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we put to death sin in us. We know from Philippians 2, Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God in you, the Holy Spirit. I mean, if you look at the lives of these people that Joel prophesied about, the Holy Spirit being poured out, if you look at the lives of these people in the book of Acts, the early church throughout the New Testament, they are marked by holiness. I mean, these people are sacrificial. They're giving up property. They're giving up money. They're bearing with each other when there's difficult relationship problems, communication, uh, and most notably of all, the fear of God is all over the early church. You can read about it many different times in the book of Acts where it says, and the fear of God was upon them all. How? Because the Holy Spirit was present and was empowering them to live holy lives. I've got two more that I felt the Lord wanted me to share. Number five, God's Spirit in us brings about tremendous fruit for his glory. When Peter preached, you know, 13 people got saved. Oh wait, I got that wrong? 3,000 people got saved. And then uh, just the next chapter later, two chapters later, uh, another several thousand are saved. And then as the book of Acts goes on, we're told that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That is a lot of fruit. And we know that, that those 12, 11, 12, and then 120, and then growing, turned the world upside down or right side up. And they were accused of that even later on in the book of Acts by religious leaders. Oh, they're turning the world upside down. And they've come here to Jerusalem. They're spreading this message. They, they did. They changed the world because the Holy Spirit was in them and empowering them. And they, everyone lived on mission. They lived as if they were on mission. They no longer lived for their careers. They no longer lived for themselves because the Holy Spirit was poured out now upon them. And they lived on a mission to be a witness for Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit that Joel talked about. And so, for example, when, when Saul came on the scene and broke out a terrible persecution against the church, and everyone except for the apostles was scattered all out, all, all around the area, what does it say? They preached the word wherever they went. These weren't apostles. These weren't church leaders at all. They were just church members. They were just average. They, they weren't le in any sort of leadership. And yet, everywhere they went, they preached the word. Everywhere they went. Because, 
again, they were empowered with the Holy Spirit. When we read the book of Acts, I mean, if you just are honest, and then you look at today, do you not see a big gulf, a big difference between the fruit, the blessing, the movement of God in the book of Acts and what we see today? And look, I know that because I've heard it so many times, and I just, I will never, I will never agree to embrace this idea, but I've heard so many people say that the book of Acts, that was just a different time. God needed to validate this message of the gospel that was now complete. Now Jesus had died and rose from the dead. Holy Spirit poured out. He needed to validate it. And that's why there were miracles. That's why there were signs and wonders. That's why there was 3,000 people being saved and then more and then more. But today we're in a different day. We don't need to have those things validated. The gospel's already established. God has already completed the word. The canon of scripture is closed. So, and there's a lot of Bible teachers that would say that. There's a lot of people that would say that. In fact, Kiki and I went to school together at a, co a Christian college. It was a great school, but we were taught that in our school as well because people recognize there's a problem. They're not seeing the Holy Spirit move like he did here. And so either you explain it away by saying something's missing in us or something's missing where that's not really meant for us. It's a lot easier to say it's not meant for us and accept the, the life that we have. I refuse to do that. I believe with all my heart, but backed by Scripture, that God desires us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I know someone might say, well, wait a second. We're already filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what this is all about? To be a Christian, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, of course. To be a Christian, the Holy Spirit must dwell inside of you. The moment you put your faith in Jesus and repent of your sins, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you. That's not the same thing as being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is the difference. I believe with all my heart that what Peter spoke about in this sermon, especially at verse 37, if you just want to look at it, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles' brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. That's us. And uh, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The gift of the Holy Spirit is to indwell us by saving faith in Jesus, but also to fill us for supernatural work. And I'm not talking about signs and wonders. I, I, of course God still does that, and God can and will do that through us, but that's not the focus. The focus is just supernatural uh, work to glorify God, to be able to see people saved, to be able to preach to teach the word with an anointing, to be able to, when you're talking to a coworker, be able to speak to them with a supernatural anointing that doesn't come from just having knowledge. Oh, I know the gospel. It's A, B, and C. Here, coworker, A, B, and C. Not that, but a supernatural ability to be able to say A, B, and C with power behind it. Not because you're a really good speaker or because you've got some really good examples that you like to use and so therefore it's powerful. No, powerful because the Holy Spirit is upon you. And the reason why is because you're a vessel. You're a willing, surrendered, yielded vessel that the Holy Spirit is eager to fill. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit is not ready to fill every one of us? Because some of us are not putting ourselves in a place where we're able to be filled. And the reason why is we're, we're filled with ourselves. What does the Holy Spirit do? He glorifies Jesus. And if there's a vessel, and this vessel is more interested in glorifying himself, herself, why would the Holy Spirit give this filling? Why would the Holy Spirit just come upon that person when really, though they love the Lord, they're truly saved, but really they're more interested in their own kingdom. They're more interested in building up their own name, in being an amazing preacher, 
in being an amazing worship leader? Why would the Holy Spirit fill, fill that vessel? The promise of the Holy Spirit, we've already received that promise at salvation. I mean, every one of us, as long as you know the Lord, as long as you've been saved, as long as you've taken shelter in Jesus, you have received the Holy Spirit. And you can't change that. Even in seasons of sin, the Holy Spirit will never leave us. He, we are a temple. But I don't want to just be indwelt. I don't just want to have the Holy Spirit in me. I want the Holy Spirit upon me. I want, like Jesus described, rivers of living water to flow out from me. And when he gave that word picture, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what you want? What we want for the tabernacle? Forget the tabernacle. For your own life. Just start there. Isn't that what you want for your life? To be filled. To be, you know, in the early church when they had that problem with widows were being overlooked. Remember, we just went over it recently. Uh, Pastor Dan shared. And God gave wisdom to Peter, the leader, to let's choose seven men. Here's what we need to find. Seven men that are filled with wisdom. I forget the other qualification, but one of them was, and filled with the Spirit. Now, wait a second. If every believer is already filled with the Holy Spirit, because not everybody, again, there is an Maybe a better way is just to say, I think it's just easier to remember, just a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit because like D.L. Moody said, we leak. Has anybody recognized that about yourself? You leak. You grieve. I grieve the Holy Spirit. And it's almost like power goes out from us in a sense. I want, I long, I yearn for more of the Holy Spirit. Um, if, if we're a vessel that has undealt with sin, we all have, to some degree, undealt with sin. But what I mean by that is there's sin in your life that you know it's there, but you're not taking the action to fight it. You're not taking any kind of measure, cutting off your right hand to get rid of it. Don't expect the Holy Spirit to fill you or to fill me if we're not taking sin Seriously, I mentioned an example earlier for having a, a mind toward our own kingdom and not that of the Lord's. Don't expect the Holy Spirit to fill you. Is God still going to use you? Of course. Does God still love you? Of course. Are you still his child? Of course. Is what you do for the Lord meaningless now? No. But don't we want more power? And don't we want to be able to, when we witness to someone, for there to be an effectiveness there and, and a clarity of our words? And we wanna, don't we want to be a better dad? And a better wife, a mo better mother, a, a, a better member of the church, a better pastor, a better leader, a better worship leader? Don't we want to honor the Lord more? That's really what it comes down to. And my confession is that I, I really am so thirsty. And I think a lot of you are too, but I long to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to overflow with rivers of living water. I am not content with what we look at today, uh, the American church. I'm not content with that. That is not the book of Acts. I believe that God has more for us. And I believe that when Joel prophesied about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't confined to just Acts 2, that it went throughout the church age, all the way up to the end, the great and final day of the Lord. Um, as we close, I, I didn't, I, time, of course, escaped. And I, I, I really wanted to save some time for questions, but I also have a song. Because how could, you, how could you possibly end a service like this and not have an opportunity to respond in prayer and in reflection? And Aaron's going to play it in just a second. So we might have time for questions, probably not. But listen, uh, if you have a question after the song, uh, just stick around, and, and I'll do my best to answer any questions uh, that anybody might have. But I'm going to share one scripture with you, and then something that I read a long time ago. One thing that Paul said in Ephesians 5:18, he said, 
do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Once again, if you're already filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's the measure that you're going to have, why does Paul tell us to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Last thing, Tozer, A.W. Tozer. I love A.W. Tozer. Has anybody ever read any of his books or anything? Sermons? He wrote a book called, um, I think it was called How to Be Filled with the Holy Spirit. I think that's the name of it. And in the book he said, Satan has opposed the doctrine of the Spirit-filled life about as bitterly as any other doctrine there is. He has confused it, opposed it, surrounded it with false notions and fears. He has blocked every effort of the Church of Christ to receive from the Father her divine and blood-bought patrimony. The Church has tragically neglected this great liberating truth that there is now for the child of God a full and wonderful and completely satisfying anointing with the Holy Ghost. Satan opposes this message, this truth that the Holy Spirit desires to fill us because Satan knows that when we start to seek the Lord in prayer, we start to get serious. We start to really thirst and cry out for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And we start to get ourselves, our heart, as a living sacrifice, as a vessel that's ready. Satan knows there's going to be some powerful stuff coming from that person's life. God is going to use them. Souls are going to be saved. Ministries are going to be blessed. Lives are going to be changed for God's glory. And Satan opposes that. And so to keep us content with what we've got by, ah, that's not for us. And, and giving these crazy examples, Pentecostal circles of gold dust falling from the ceiling and ah, da, 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 crazy weirdo, weirdo, wacko, unbiblical stuff that's not the Holy Spirit. Like the school we went to, that's probably what they thought about when it came to being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the wacko fake stuff that's used by Satan to keep us from the real, genuine, outpouring, filling baptism of the Holy Spirit. As we play this song, if you want to come up here and just bow before the Lord, you can. You can stay at your seat too. But this is about an eight-minute song. So it gives us a good amount of time to just reflect and to pray and to take what Joel said, what he prophesied, that future day, that was directly aimed at us and the people in, in the book of Acts and all throughout this, what we call the church age, to take that to heart and just to examine our hearts. So Lord, we do thank you for your word. Man, thank you for your word that teaches us, your word that instructs us, your word that enlightens us, revives us, leads us, guides us, corrects us, warns us, stops us, changes us, uh, impacts us. Thank you for your word. And this morning we thank you for your word about the Holy Spirit, the person, not the thing, the force, the, 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 the wind, the person of the Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come upon us, to fill us, to change us for extraordinary ministry, extraordinary service to our Lord. We welcome you this morning. Please convict us of what would be standing in the way of us being filled with your Holy Spirit. If it's an undealt with sin, please convict us. If it's that we're seeking our own kingdom and our own glory, show us. If it's that we're not even really pursuing you, we're not spending nights in prayer, time in prayer, earnest, diligent prayer, show us. Speak to us, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
praise you, God. We know that 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 word is the key, Lord, surrender. We know that that is necessary to be able to walk in the fullness of your Holy Spirit. We must surrender. And I pray that as we leave here this morning that you would show us by the ministry of your Holy Spirit convicting our hearts. Show us, Lord, what is it that we're, we're holding back? We're not willing to just lay it down. What sin is it, Lord, that we're just not taking seriously? We're just letting uh, it continue in our lives. Lord, what attitude do we have that is wrong, that we're not willing to crucify? What thing is it, Lord, what, what, is it, what spiritual matter are we neglecting, Lord, that, that would prevent us from being filled with your Holy Spirit? Because if there's a lack of being filled with your, your Holy Spirit, then there's a reason for it. And we pray that you'd show us, Lord, and we pray that we would have our own Pentecost, Lord, that we would have our own outpouring of your Holy Spirit for your glory that we would be bold and effective witnesses, Lord, that we would be holy, Lord, that we would put to death sin in our lives like never before, that we would have true unity and a special bond like never before with our family and the Lord, that we'd see tremendous fruit, Lord, people coming to Christ through our ministry, through our evangelism, like we've never seen before, that we would see you do great and mighty things that we've never seen before, Lord. We ask you for these things. And we just thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.